Next up, it's uh, one of my colleagues, my partner in crime in all things broadcast, Toby Byrne, president of advertising at Fox and Fox Sports Media Group. So please thank David and welcome Toby. Hi, everybody. Um, I know we're making a real effort today to be balanced in our approach. All the five networks are here together, uh, some unity. So I, I think Joanne did welcome you. I couldn't quite hear if Linda welcomed you. I, uh, I want to welcome you only if Linda did too. If she didn't welcome you, then this is not an official welcome. But thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, I'm here to kick off the next uh, panel. It's great storytelling. Uh, Roundtable with Broadcast TV's top producers and programming executives. Now, we've all heard the saying that content is king. Um, as a sales guy, by the way, I used to think it was cash that was king. I'm not sure when content got the, got the throne. Um, we all love cash, right? Maybe it's close to being the king. But content is definitely the king. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, but it's not all content is not created equal. And, uh, and certainly our broadcast content, we feel, is the best content out there. And uh, we feel it's really not just content is king, it's great content that is king. Uh, and really no place has as much great content as broadcast TV. From the middle to the good wife, Law & Order, SVU, uh, to Arrow, to Sleepy Hollow, and that's one show per network. So I'm not going to mention Gotham, because um, that would be overstepping. Uh, but the quality of broadcast television and the content is really uh, something that we're all proud about. And great content drives engagement and really deep engagement. You know, we see our, the audiences following our content uh, wherever it is, um, choosing when they want to watch it and how they want to watch it. And that's truly, uh, you know, this, this generation's version of appointment television. Um, and you can be sure that when they're choosing to watch on their own timetable, on the device of their choice or on the big screen television, that uh, it's a great environment, that they're engaged, um, and really that's what we provide, a premium, dynamic, safe environment for your messaging. Uh, you know, it's ad week, so you run into a lot of interesting people during ad week. And yesterday I was talking to uh, a guy who was wearing sneakers, and he was younger than I was, and naturally he was a CEO of a digital company. Um, and he was talking about, we were having a conversation about video content, and uh, it was interesting because this person's interested in, in getting his hands on some of our great content that, that we put online. Uh, and then he made the comment about some of the, um, what he referred to as the cesspool of dark video impressions that are on online video, uh, driven by a lack of viewability and heavy fraud. And I thought that was kind of harsh. Uh, I thought it was kind of nice he said it to me because I told him I'd probably regurgitate it today. But I thought it was kind of harsh. Uh, and there, there are a lot of options out there for, uh, for your, your your impressions and how you want to reach audiences. Uh, but truly, and those impressions are very cheap and they're attractive for that reason. But as he said yesterday, uh, it occurred to me that you know, sometimes you get what you pay for and sometimes you get even less than what you pay for. And sometimes you have to be really careful about that. So broadcast TV's premium environment is so important uh, to great storytelling. And I'll transition now into the panel and get off my little soapbox um, and hopefully uh, it's very important, not only that storytelling to engaging viewers, but also engaging uh, you, our, our customers, and advertising partners. So today we'll hear directly from some of the very best content creators. These storytellers are the best in the business. Uh, plus, you also hear from a, a relatively newly, uh, newly crowned head of a network who also happens to be a very established head of a studio. Uh, and that's all wrapped up into one. So they'll show you how great storying, storytelling is truly the heart and soul of our entertainment business. So now I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator of the panel, uh, Cynthia Littleton, and we can all congratulate her. I believe she was very recently promoted to the managing editor uh, of television at Variety. Cynthia. We were counting the number of times Toby said broadcast in his remarks, but you know what? It has been a great 
two-week period for broadcast TV. A lot of people showed up to premiere week. A lot of effort and promotion and blood, sweat, and tears goes into these shows, and it's really great. America showed up, and that is a good thing. That is absolutely a good thing. So thank you all for coming, and especially thanks to all of you. Every one of these people is in the thick of their, you know, one of their busiest times of the year. So we really appreciate you taking 45 minutes out to do this panel for us. I'm not, we don't have too much time, so I'm not going to belabor the introduction, because I know you guys have some literature, and, I, and you know their names, or you certainly <laughs> know their shows. So real quick, we're just going to go down the line. Chairman and CEO of Fox Television Group, Dana Walden. <laughs> oh, she oversees Fox Broadcasting, programming for Fox Broadcasting and 20th Century Fox TV, which happens to be one of the industry's biggest, strongest, most powerhouse producers of programming. So a lot of shows flow through Dana Walden. Eileen Heisler, <laughs> co-creator of a very funny comedy, a real, a real a workhorse for ABC, The Middle, co-creator and showrunner. Uh, next to Eileen, we have Michelle King and Robert King, the co-creators and showrunners of The Good Wife. <laughs> little show you might have heard of. Next to Robert is Warren Light, sh showrunner of <laughs> 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 Sorry. He just happened off the stage. Yeah. Later. We'll lead the awkward clapping. Yeah, we'll showrunner awkward. of one of TV's most durable franchises, Law & Order SVU. And last but not least is Greg Berlanti. Multitasker. The multitasker, yeah. the plate spinner in the audience, <laughs> who's only got three shows on the air this fall, uh, The Flash, Arrow, and NBC's Mysteries of Laura. And he just finished uh, winging back and forth to London for most of this year, producing a very big feature film for Warner Brothers TV called Pan. Wow. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> so again, as the topic of the day is broadcast TV, Let's start with the jump ball for anybody who wants to weigh in. What is it that stands out in your mind? What is it that is unique about storytelling in t broadcast TV, broadcast TV as a platform for the programming that you all create? Do you want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think what is unique and what's great is look over the past week and a half when you looked at premiere week for each of the major broadcast networks, and you saw each and every one of us create events. You know, um, every network had something to rave about. Um, shows were platformed in a way that was kind of dazzling when you look at what CBS did with their Monday night and platforming Scorpion, which held up in the second week and seems to be a bona fide hit, or ABC creating two branded fantastic nights of programming with Wednesday Night Family, finally using <laughs> Helene's amazing show, The Middle, and our show, Modern Family, to platform two new family comedies. And then what they did with Shonda on Thursday night was just kind of great showmanship. They branded the night. They went after it. You can't drive down the street without seeing billboards. It mm -hmm. becomes part of the cultural conversation. And I find that really, oh, and NBC also with The Voice and Blacklist, even driving here today, I was in the car with Jennifer Salke, and we passed one of those buses that's just plastered with the blacklist. Mm -hmm. And it, these are events. These are unlike any other type of entertainment where people are talking about them, people are making an appointment to view them. I know we've been talking a lot about they're viewing them in different ways, but they're making a point to see these shows. And the broadcasters are demonstrating extraordinary showmanship. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we shouldn't forget uh, Gotham. Oh, I should probably mm -hmm. show on Fox. Since Gotham Toby mentioned well. Gotham, mm -hmm. I will say that you know when everything is said and done on Gotham, you know after you know the first week, we're looking at 13, 14 million viewers, and again, people are watching in a different way, and and we're being judged in a different way. But you know, 35 million people watched broadcast television live same day last week. Mm -hmm. That's an extraordinary number of viewers. And actually, it's up a little bit from last year. Mm -hmm. So lots of great news. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. good news. Producers, you guys have a lot of options mm -hmm. of where you go. There's more places than ever if you have an idea. And you all are, you know, working very productively in broadcast TV. Say Talk something about smart. It. Well, no, I, all I was going to say, uh, the other, uh, I've done, you know, HBO, FX, and NBC, and USA. I've, I've been shopped around. What, um, what I find interesting about network, because of the number of episodes demanded, we have a much shorter turnaround time. 
So we can, I mean, we had last night the elevator fight sequence in our episode. Uh, and, and we can just be, if you're writing a show like ours or like yours, you can, you can uh, stay right, I try to stay 10 minutes ahead of the breaking news on our, <laughs> our show. And, and, and you shoot it on, sometimes you shoot it on a, a, on a Friday and it's on air the following Wednesday. And I like that immediacy. And when I've been on cable, there's a longer period of time, sometimes decades before it airs. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. TV, it just, it, it, boy, yeah. you can get it on quickly. Well, and yeah. you, you make a lot. Like, our, our show's made 24 episodes every year, which is exhausting. But, um, but great. And, and you, it, broadcast is just the center of where, where it's happening. You know, I still think even though cable, even though all these things are changing and it's exciting, I think it was kind of clear to us when we were at, um, we shot a show at Disney World last year. And we had people on the train saying, I love your show, which for our show was never, we never see anyone sing. I mean, we, we've lived a little in the shadow of, of Modern Family. And to have, to be there and realize that you're impacting a lot of people in a great age range of people is exciting. And I happen to have worked my whole career in broadcast. Mm -hmm. So that's what I know. But, but that, I think the ability to reach that many people is what's exciting that we could, nine million people could have seen the show last week. And it's, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Robert and Michelle, you, you are often <laughs> held, you know, Good Wife is often held up as the standard bearer of the show that goes up against all those edgier cable dramas. <laughs> does, that, is that, um, does that feel like a burden at, at times for you all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would imagine, you know, no uh, pressure. Uh, were you going to say you like the speed I of was, it? I was going to say, actually, it wasn't a burden. So you oh, got, oh. You, you got the burden first. Well, are you saying a burden to kind of have that feeling behind it that, oh, standard bearer, all that. Yeah, I mean. I, you know, we just don't, we, it, it, you just kind of do it. I was going to say one thing we like about network is the speed, but mm -hmm. also with development. Because having started in movies, it often feels like cable development is similar to movies. Everybody has a lot more time, so it's so slow. Mm -hmm. It's so great to either get an, a, an answer yes or no, but immediately. And then also doing 22 a year, as we do, you do just have final cut. Just because no one has yeah. any time. time you right. just, if you like a joke, but it's maybe not perfect, you just try it and, you know, things that you didn't expect to rise, rise. If you're given all that much freedom, we find incredible freedom from CBS. It is shocking. I mean, the other nice thing is that if you're doing 22 episodes a year or 24, whatever, you can take more risks or feel that you can. I mean, I think if we were doing 12 episodes a year, everything would feel a little more precious. Oh. But we do 22. We had an episode where Hugo Chavez appeared and was played by Matt Zucre in a fat suit. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no way we would do that if we were doing eight episodes. <laughs> You're going to judge you on that. Yeah. That's next year's True Detective. <laughs> We're doing that. That's a really good point, yeah. Michelle. I appreciate that. Greg? I would just say I've watched over the last decade a lot of my friends who work in features want to be, are more and more desperate to get into television. And I think part of that is the discrepancy between the two is just minimizing, you know? And uh, you can do, I mean, I, I think a lot of times showrunners love to say, oh, we like to make a movie every week. But I, I really feel like we, everyone is now, you know? And, and part of that is that the audience is flipping between so many different things and has so many options. And it's often comparing sometimes a show you're making to a film that had a budget of $150 million. And, and you have to hold up. You know, you have to hold up narratively. You have to hold up in terms of what's exciting and interesting and keeping their interest. Uh, and so you're, you're sort of suddenly, and, and because there are also Apple TV exists and all these other things, you're all, sometimes you're competing with every mm -hmm. show that's ever existed as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so you're competing with films and with, uh, and so everybody has to sort of up their game. It means that the season that we're working on the shows, I think is a, a lot longer. It used to be we were done in, I don't know, March or April, and now you're kind of working into May, and the last episode goes, and you get like a week off when everybody goes and picks up new series, and then you go back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's really gratifying for that same reason. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, Greg, you, I mean, you in the past couple of years have juggled so, you know, multiple shows per season. How, with, with order, you know, hefty 22 episode orders, how, how do you manage it? How do you do that? I do, I mean, for me, the secret is I just work with a lot of the same people or people that I know really well. Or, and and I, I don't think it's that different from just, just running one show is impossible. You know? I think <laughs> once you realize that, you know, it's sort of is, it's uh, whether or not, you know, uh, you'll still work the same number of hours a day if you're that kind of person, you know. And, and uh, I've been really blessed to work with a lot of the same 
individuals and we develop a shorthand. And, and uh, the, the, the drawback, if there's any, is you can have a day where everything's, something's going wrong on everything you're participating <laughs> in. Uh, but usually it's not that. Usually it's, there's, it, it balances the things out. And they can inform each other. And writers can cross episodes. And editors can cross episodes. And actors can cross episodes. And they can actually help lift everything lift everything up. So that's, that's the rewarding part of it. Mm -hmm. Is that, I would imagine also for the showrunners, is that one of the hardest parts of the job is if you're, especially if you're knee deep in an episode that you've written or an episode that you're directing, is it hard to then, after it's all shot and you're putting it together in post-production editing, is it hard to take that step back and be objective as the produce, as the kind of the classic producer role? It's very, it's very funny. I think when you're a showrunner, it's, it's like, Lucy at the candy store. You yeah. know, you at any given moment, you have one coming, you have one oh. on the stage, you have one. <laughs> the assembly doing. line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and sometimes you don't like. You're not really able, I don't think, to step back from it completely until like syndication, <laughs> or you happen to see it a year later, and you say, "Oh my gosh, all those little moments I worried about, they're, they're fine." You know, <laughs> but it's it's very. It is a giant like organizational task, and your job as a showrunner, being a writer and handling the producer stuff. I mean, I think most people have, I have a partner, most people have some kind of partner that helps them, either it's your writing partner or someone you trust to be your second person. It takes a lot of people. And it's, um, I think it's, it's something, it, it, that's the thing about uh, network television. It's just, you're in the trenches. You are just making, it's like a, a very big factory and it's coming. Like, you can't rest and go, well, that was fun. You can't even enjoy, you know, you just enjoyed what was on last night, but you can take like one second and say, oh, we're so proud of us, now what's the next problem? It's so it's like, it's like an ER kind of, mm -hmm. of television, I guess. And, and, and like in an ER, you can't be precious. No, I mean, you uh, can't. You, you, so that I don't think you can survive as a showrunner if you can't let go of each stage. And it's like, this is where we are now, I can't worry about, sometimes I'll be upset about the location that I told them about. Yeah. You know, um, but you just have to keep moving and you, it's funny, the younger writers, are, sometimes I have a hard time explaining, I could let you rewrite this, but I'm just going to do it faster, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, but we don't have time for you to cling to things that I know aren't going to... You just sort of know. You've played enough games of chess, and you, you just have to move on to the next one and the next one, and you can't... There's no time to cling to... No, it's like a shredder that's eating your scripts. You yeah. feel very flush at the I mean, beginning. And, I have nine, you know, and then you're like, whoa, 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 oh my God, you know. And, and if you preface you it by, this is my yeah. favorite line, I asked you to write it, I'm glad it's in, I'm taking it out now. <laughs> and, and so you... Uh, and that's just how it goes. You, I don't think there's any room for um, uh, being kind to yourself. You know. Dana, in your experience, being an executive on it, and, you know, your company is produced many very prestigious cable shows and of course a lot of a lot of broadcast is there a difference in the muscles that showrunners exercise if they're producing for broadcast versus cable is some of what we heard something that you recognize as your you know reviewing scripts and screening episodes I don't really think so I mean honestly I find that um, particularly on these big event dramas a production wants to take as much time as you give it so just because you have an expand, expanded amount of time, that just causes a, you know, a bigger show. I don't think Ryan Murphy on American Horror Story says, I have a great luxury of time, and I have more than <laughs> Helene's five seconds <laughs> compared to the work that he's done on Glee. I think that you know, mm -hmm. we get into business with the best creators. That's where we like to start, people that have a voice, people that have a vision, people who have a story to tell. And then our job is twofold. One is to get that story to the place where it is best suited. Mm -hmm. And in a situation like Homeland, you know, we pitched Homeland mm -hmm. to every broadcast network, and everyone passed. It was a little bit of an odd time because 24 had just gone off the air, and I think people thought that type of storytelling was overly ambitious, which there's been a lot of it since mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And Showtime loved it. David Nevins connected with it in such a passionate way. It was very clear that was the right place for it. Gotham, conversely, you know, Peter Roth and Bruno Heller felt very strongly that it's an incredibly broad show, that there's no reason why multiple generations of families couldn't watch the show together on their own, that there was no circumstance that made that show um, feel like a cable show, and they wanted to reach the maximum audience, and they chose broadcast for that. So I don't think it is so different, and I think the lines have been blurred, you know, the network model is so much more elastic now than it used to be. Networks order 13 episodes of a big drama or 15 episodes of a big drama, or they do 22 episodes of mm -hmm. something that has a strong procedural engine. 
I think the good news about cable is it's forced networks to really evaluate how flexible they can be to accommodate talent like the people that are sitting on this panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point is that, that broadcast network has, broadcasters have gotten a little less rigid, certainly in episodic order. Is that, is that something that you guys think down the road will be, as, as much as you've talked about enjoying the, the, the sort of accelerated tension of doing a 22, is that something that you guys are looking to explore down the road? I dream of a 13 episode season. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not yeah. in your future. <laughs> <laughs> they, could, they could be so good. Well, it's nice to have the flexibility that if one comes up with an idea that is best mm -hmm. suited for 13 a year, mm -hmm. that there is that option. Or this one year only, which sometimes you do inadvertently, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but that one year, this is a, I want to do a 10 episode thing about, I don't know, the House on American Activities Committee. There's a pitch. Um, but, that sounds but, very sexy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and it's just 10 episodes and you can then think of it as a three act mm -hmm. structure. That's kind of a, a great liberating thing. There's some ideas that aren't going to go on for, the question when you pitch is, where do you see this show mm -hmm. in the eighth year? And the, the truth is, Good luck getting past episode three, but but they want to know where it will go, and some stories really fit nicely in a one-year run, and that's a great thing that's just beginning to emerge. Mm -hmm. I think. And is that a business? I mean, that the the limited, contained mm -hmm. ten episode that can be a business now. In yes, the absolutely. Age of you know, it, it, it all depends. You have to look at every piece of business, every piece of content. You have to look at at in a different light. It's not one size fits all for us doing twenty four and doing a new installment of 24 that reinvigorated the entire too, yeah. library mm -hmm. and gave viewers who had such a strong connection to this character in this franchise a great opportunity to be re reunited with Jack, ba Jack Bauer. And it made sense for us on the studio side and the network was thrilled about it. So I don't think, you know, the network, FBC is trying to get out of the limited series business we're in the event series business. So there has to be a good reason for it, something mm -hmm. that elevates it beyond just this is something, you know, um, Wayward Pines that we're doing right now or Grace Point. Grace Point is a murder mystery that, that is solved over 10 episodes and then you're done. And that's how we're going after it. Obviously it's, it's Broadchurch, it's the American version of Broadchurch. But the UK series that was very yes, acclaimed, yeah. That's right. And so there was a reason to do it in that you could get complete closure. It wasn't something that viewers had to commit to long term. It's extremely premium. It looks beautiful. And it's told in 10 episodes. So there was a reason for us to do that. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Of course, broadcast TV is more, um, uh, is more vulnerable to content issues. Um, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the regulatory overlay of you know, the FCC can, can come in and, mm -hmm. and levy fines where they can't on cable. But this being advertising week, you know, in the past, there, I think advertisers had been sort of seen as as scapegoats of well we can't we can't go there on broadcast TV the advertisers will never you know they, they'll revolt they'll pull their spots but it feels like there's you know in a world of blurring lines that there is you know there is a fair amount of edgy stuff on broadcast TV is it your experience that the pressure from advertisers is less than maybe it used to be. In terms, of, uh, in terms of on content issues or, or as it's communicated to you from the network? We're told it's less. <laughs> I mean, I, it, sometimes you don't see it in action, but yes, we're told it's less and that most of it seems to be this fear, this chilling effect from the FCC. I mean, that's my experience. Um, you know, sometimes, look, you'd love for people to be able to Google something and see Google mm -hmm. because sometimes we make up stupid names instead of yeah, things fun. in real life. And so we fictionalize our whole world where our Google is chum hum and created mm. backstory. You know, you, you try to get around it, but I'm amazed how much chilling effect FCC still has. I mean, because they're frightening, I think, to networks. But I, we're able to get ahead of, I mean, one of the things is to use the FCC and that worry about the sexual content and to take advantage of it in that I think often cable brands itself by using breasts. You know, women's, usually Irish women's breasts <laughs> is what they use. In, uh, in our show, we, when people have sex, we're usually on their faces, and we have such good actors, it's usually, I think, more enticing because of that. So you find ways around it, which is worthy, too. 
but it would be lovely to get around some of the inhibitions about language. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just because, I'm sorry, everybody's watching what's on cable, everybody. I, I, we, we don't want it for everything, and, and you can really get away with a ton with violence. It's kind of odd how much mm -hmm. you can get yeah. away with violence. Yeah, yeah. yeah Warren. Yeah, no, no, that's the split. <laughs> uh, apparently, it's okay. Well, we, we, it, it, you're fine, and there are a lot of shows doing this. You're fine eviscerating someone, but I'll get a note that uh, sometimes you can't have a headboard bang against the wall in a in a scene of, of uh, intimacy without violence. And I, I, so that part is confusing to me, and I, I think wrong. Yeah. Ultimately, I'd rather people uh, go the other way with that. But but there is a that there's a weird sort of blue law about what you can show sexually. I, personally, I love getting the notes from our standards. Yeah. Because it's a caution, please, with, you know, they're, they're beautifully worded. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't mind, mostly the language things end up forcing us to, uh, thank God for Urban Dictionary. You know, we, we end up looking for other weird ways of saying things that are sometimes more entertaining. Um, and, and that can mostly be OK. Um, the thing that does drive me crazy is, uh, I don't, we, we have to Greek Every product, right? Yes. Yeah. So th that's what it's called, where you can't have a product name. So if you're in a, if you, let's say you do a scene where you walk, the detectives walk into a pharmacy, you can't see any product because it might conflict with an advertiser on your show, or 40 years from now with an advertising <laughs> syndication in Kazakhstan. And so um, we have to like make up every every toothpaste, and it's just, uh, it, and you have to then clear the name of every <laughs> brand, and it's. So I, I will have emails at 2 in the morning, we need six more names of yeah. toothpastes. And it's like, really? Uh, uh, they're clear? That no, what, come up with a good toothpaste name that nobody else has. You know, and, um, and that kind of drives me. Yeah. I, I just wish they'd all give each other amnesty on the drugstore <laughs> and bodega scenes. You know? uh, maybe you guys can, can do it, that. It seems like on ABC it's loosened a hair in terms of brand name show. And it, it's hard as a comedy writer because brands of names are funny. You think people want to recognize something that mm -hmm. they know. So that's something that's really been hard. And this year it seems to have changed a bit. Like you can't always do one, if you're doing three kinds of candy, you know, we've done something where I think someone was using a lot of medicine, pretending to be sick, and there was a lot of medicine on the bedside. And I think if we had a variety of real medicines, it was okay. But if we had had like a bunch of one, we could. Right. But, um, right. but I mean, our show is very clean, it's clean. Mm -hmm. um, we try to be edgy in our clean, you know, right. like we, we make right. jokes that, you know, if you're a parent, you would know it was edgy, but hopefully your kid doesn't ask you what that right. is. Um, you know, um, but, uh, but, on broad, it's difficult, I think, a weird thing for everybody, I think it was touched upon for you guys too, in terms of Emmys and awards and things, it's, it's, it, they are different things that we're, I think, it is, it, I think there is in some way a, a greater challenge to not just go for the sex or go for the, you know, have 40 minutes or whatever, you know, on broadcast, I think there, it, you are playing a little bit of a different game that, that does hopefully up your game because you're held, you, you can't do the other stuff, you just can't. You have to, you have to go <laughs> Yeah, you have to. And longer doesn't always mean better. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And so. Greg, I mean, your shows tend to target a, you know, a younger demographic yeah. that, as we all know, as parents, we all know they're an earthier bunch. Do you feel, do you, have you felt at times constrained in what you can have your characters say or react to? Or I, I really haven't. I, I, I personally believe that less is more a lot of times and does force creativity. Uh, there was a great sex scene and how to get away with murder. It was like last week, a gay sex scene that I thought was as sexy as anything that's been on cable mm -hmm. in the last whatever. Uh, and it was, there was, it was not very long, but it was very telling. And I thought it was uh, really smart storytelling in terms of how they crafted it and pulled it off. Uh, but I, I do think you have to use your own personal, a lot of times, with, whether it's with violence or with sex or whatever it is, it's your own, you, you really have to, your name's on the show, and it's on that episode. And, and uh, you know, I just I don't want anything going out that makes me feel uncomfortable. That I'm putting that out into the world. That's something that's extra violent or something that's, you know, uh, unnecessarily you know sexual or sexualized. Uh, that being said, with things like Everwood or uh, Brothers and Sisters or Dawson's, you know, we were when you're doing family shows and the narrative that you're telling is you know there's it's not a procedural element. It's the things that are happening to these people in their lives. Uh, I think if, if you want those, those kind of shows to stay on network television that are character shows about people, they have to be really contemporary and really relevant, and they have to deal with issues that might make you know, people mm -hmm. and broadcasters or, or standards and practices uncomfortable. You know, we, did a, we did an episode where a little girl says, you know, shit for the first time, 
And it was, you know, they were, standards and practices was on the mix stage with me saying, okay, you can say that much of shit, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but you're also, you're dealing with sensitive topics and you want to deal with them. We, we had done the first, uh, we put the first abortion on uh, television with Everwood that had been on, I think, that wasn't a, a, a you know, a, a medical procedure that had to happen because someone's life was in jeopardy, but actually a choice uh, that had hap that had to happen since Maud. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so it had been that long. And I do think for network television to keep staying relevant, you, you have to, if you're doing particularly character-driven shows, you have to deal with stuff that's sensitive. Right. They, they you know, they, they, they can't always be in PG-13 right. territory. That's great. That's interesting. Well, thank you. Um, we couldn't have a panel about network television or television in general without talking about the, the, the many new ways that people are consuming television, watching television, you know, Binge has has taken on a whole new connotation. Um, broadcast TV does not have this does not typically have the same uh, latitude as cable to rerun multiple episodes during this during a week. Uh, the same kind of um, oftentimes also on um, online platforms. The the same availability of episodes is that does that feel at all constraining to any of you in terms of ha having your shows available or being a network programmer? Well, I feel like there are many catch-up mechanisms. I mean, I, I guess that at the end of the day, what we're seeing a lot this year and over the past couple of years is that people are making appointments to watch TV. They're actually having to commit further to our shows. They have to seek them out, record them. They watch them within, you know, three, seven, 30-day time period. And it, you, you can't you know, put your head in the stand and say, we're not gonna move forward with technology and with the way people are consuming our content. Right, they're we all are, gonna come Thursday at eight. That's right, right. right, we have to embrace them and say, you know, people are watching our um, shows in as great a number almost as ever. I was looking at the, um, where we are right now with the first week of Gotham, when you roll up the seven day numbers and you look at, you know, Fox Now and Hulu, they're numbers which are comparable to the first season of House or Lost. Yeah. And so, you a know, if ago, you're looking yeah. holistically at how people are viewing, it's a very strong time in network television. I guess the only thing frustrating to me is that the metrics and the rating system is not really caught up with how our viewers want to consume our shows. But I don't find us to be limited by the number of plays we can take or the way that we can repeat them. It's actually why I think network television, if you're a content owner, it is the preferential place to be because the tale is so long. You know, it is the shows that build Netflix and Hulu mm -hmm. and travel around the world mm -hmm. and, you know, it's the engine and yeah. there's a good reason. So as as a content owner, I love Modern Family. Mm -hmm. You know, as a content owner, I also love Homeland, American Horror Story, and Sons of Anarchy, but you can't beat that big broadcast hit. Mm -hmm. The platform is, is, a, is a little taller. I, I had to change the approach to writing when I came. I had started out in the Dick Wolf world, uh, and there the mantra is any show can rerun at any time, anywhere in the world, or any <laughs> galaxy, is. known or unknown. And it's, uh, um, <laughs> So therefore, the, the, every episode had to be completely self-contained and you cannot, and, and the characters aren't supposed to change so that you can watch it anywhere and, and not be disoriented. And it, it, I think Dick did very well with that model. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I came in to SVU, uh, my sense was that's all true and I would discuss this with Dick, uh, but I needed to make sure people watched that night because now people are paying a little more attention to L plus three, I think this year more than others, but I, uh, since my argument with Dick was, since you can watch this at any time in the rest of your life or your children's wives, you have no reason to watch it tonight. Uh, and, and I need to give people a reason they need to watch tonight or we're gonna start being in big trouble here. Mm -hmm. And so we started to, uh, and been doing it more and more each year, just give more arcs and have much more continuity than was the hallmark of, of the brand, right? So there's, a, a, there's continuing stories. Olivia has a baby this year or last mm -hmm. year. I ended a season with Olivia held at gunpoint, and I felt that would be a good way to get people to come back in September. And it, it, you know, that made Dick very nervous, but it did, that was one of his first cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think the idea was, it needs to be self-contained in the future, but for the moment, I need a reason for people the next day to say, oh, she has a baby, 
which and it seems to have helped the show kind of uh, revive in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What um, I mean, you you touch on that, but has has the idea that at some times people are going to st to stop and wait till they get three or four episodes piled up on mm -hmm. their VOD or their DVR? Has that changed the way that that you um, arc shows and the way that you the way that you pace shows at all? Is that is it affected the the core? I mean, obviously, Warren, you just referenced it, but for the I, I can't worry about that. That viewing does yeah. me no good at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my show's canceled, and two years later, people tell me they loved it, and it's like great. Um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate it, but it doesn't help me today. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I don't think it changes the way we tell stories. I think you just try to be as interesting as, you know, it'd be just, again, back to the, the model of the Lucy with the candy story. You know, you're really just trying to tell great stories. But the exciting thing now about all the other life it has, it's just more, people can come to it and come back to broadcast based on having seen it. You know, based on having hunted it down or, you know, caught it somewhere or bought it on Netflix or bought something, then all of a sudden you get new viewers to your broadcast season who just discovered it. And, and unlike, I think, in the past when you all, everyone was at the same time watching something or discovering it, that is different. Mm -hmm. So you know that this, you know, this person might Facebook and say, oh, I loved, you know, this episode. And you're like, what? That was like, you know, season two. You know, it's so different now, but, but everyone can come to it at all different times. And I think for us, you know, you're, you're just aware that, that it doesn't just end on that night, you know, that night in the repeat. You know, there's more and more ways that people can come to it, and, and that mm -hmm. I think is a good thing. But I don't think it really, for us, in comedy changes what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's got to be gratifying, though, to know that, you know, it, it's... It's, it's going to resonate out there. Yeah, it's cool. Like you just, somebody, it's very exciting when someone says, oh, I just discovered it. You know, and they discovered it through a different way and went back to, to broadcast. Mm -hmm. but, but as Dana was saying at the beginning, I think the, to go back around to the broadcast thing of having a night, mm -hmm. that's something since we've been on, this is our sixth season, we've really waited for that for so long. It's mm -hmm. so nice. You know, because now all of a sudden the network can promote it as a night and a destination. And people kind of need to be told, this is, again, the question of why are you going to watch tonight? Because you're going to get all this and it's branded and it's packaged and, it's, and that's really nice. That, that makes us feel like a part of a, a set. <laughs> you know, you're not just out there alone and then something else happens at 8.30 and then, then, then they watch and it mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, you reference Facebook, of yeah. course. Of course, we're curious how much you know there is. I mean, oodles of. I'm sure there's a whole web pages devoted to Lights Out, a great show that Warren did for FX. That was one of those um, self-contained shows that just didn't know it at the time, but yeah. a great show. <laughs> show. I'm sure there is, st is still commentary about that show. Do you pay much attention to that? Do you seek it out? Do you do you read it? I know you know the DC Comics world has no <laughs> shortage of people that. No. I, yeah, I mean that's the. I mean, if I would say similarly that uh, the conversation that happens between the audience when I first started writing TV with Dawson's, once a month we would get mail, <laughs> and it would come to the, it was fan mail that would come to the office, and then websites started sprouting up and people interacting, and now we're literally watching the episode on air, and the audience is having a conversation yeah. with the writers room. There's probably not a writers room in here that doesn't have a Twitter handle. Yeah. You know, and there's a whole, and that's 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 also one of the really cool things about the, you know, about the art form. We're we're uh, airing the first episode of Flash next week, about a week later than we did last year. So we're like a little deeper into making the episodes, and you start to really crave that, you know. But what are they going to like? You know, do they like this? Do they like that? And you can, the natural evolution that happens in that conversation, is one of the most exciting sort of parts of of getting to do what what we do, and so. Um, I think that's, that, that's been one of the things that's made TV uh, watching as a viewer and also as a storyteller that participates in it a really exciting time. I, th I think it keeps therapists busy because <laughs> it's hard. You know, you know they're out there. You know, like, like we wrote on Murphy Brown and it's like you go, I hope people liked it. I don't know. But like you can, you know, it's on and it's on right now and it's, you can't not go check. Are people liking it tonight? You know, and you feel sad when they don't or happy when they do. And, and, and it does... It doesn't influence, I mean, the drum beats do influence you. Like when you start to feel, like this year we took Sue's braces off. That was a big thing for us. And, um, <laughs> you know, in our little world, Sue's braces off are big. But, um, but it was kind of like we started realizing that there was sort of 
people wanted that to happen. You can sense that people want that to happen, that they're not going to be mad. It's not going to wreck everything. It's going to help us. And if we don't take them off, people will be mad. So in some ways, it, it does influence you. Not like every comment, yeah, but right. the, the right. overall comment, I think, influences you more than a focus group would, because yeah. it's real people. And you can we actually you know. do uh, online passenger surveys on all of our shows just to get some diagnostic information, to talk to the viewers. And we send them to our creators, and I got a really funny one back from Steve Levitan, who created Modern Family. And someone in the passenger study had said that he thought Nathan Lane's character in the episode was too flamboyant. And Steve wrote me directly. I, of course, didn't send it, but that's what happens when you run the company. <laughs> he said, I particularly appreciate this comment coming from such an esteemed author. And it was, the handle was, J. McPickle Shitter. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Everybody's got a voice. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just going to add, it can make you crazy. Yeah. I mean, personally, I just, I glance at yeah. it. We have enough family and friends that I feel like <laughs> I'll hear it. Yeah. I'll, I'll hear what the world thinks, but I'll hear it from my mother in law, and that's fine. <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment, or, or uh, I, especially uh, I broke in in cabaret and comedy world, so you knew right away if you were dying. Mm -hmm. and the, the first time I had a show on the air, I had that sort of, that's it. There was no, there was no audience. I didn't. I was very. So I like that the Twitter. Th that's a big part of what we're doing to keep our show mm -hmm. out there now, and we have every writer tweeting individually, every actor tweeting on the night of a show and, and trying to create uh, the audience a sense of, of um, the, what you get in a theater, which is a, a real sense of mm -hmm. how are we doing tonight. There's nothing you can do to that episode. But I, 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 mm. And I find over time, uh, I mean, other than people still blaming me for Chris Maloney leaving or something, <laughs> um, uh, like it's my fault, um, uh, that, that over time th there is some, something, the audience has a sense of the episodes that you kind of feared were dogs we're dogs. They're, they're, you know, very seldom do you fool 12 million people uh, <laughs> in one night. And then the ones that you're most proud of generally are the ones that go over the best. And I, I like, I, I like it. I had to. There are you. You don't pick the scab. There are certain people you just lock. <laughs> and, yeah. and once you do that, it's okay. But it's a dialogue now. Right. Is it measurable though? I mean, Dana, you. I know you're studying and crunching all these numbers. Mm -hmm. Is it? Can you translate Twitter traffic and Facebook likes and that kind of stuff to measurable increases? You know, we're trying, you know, increasingly now to be able to track that information. What we can see is genuine engagement with our shows and commitment on the viewers to try and connect with our shows. But I don't think we've been able to use it yet to say, you know, this is an increased measurement of viewing. And we do try to use it somewhat diagnostically as we look at our shows. but. Kind of as, as we were saying earlier, at the end of the day, what I'm looking for as a broadcaster and as the head of a studio is a fantastic writer with a big voice, with a big point of view that has something to say. And no amount of social media or comments from you know, people sitting in their living rooms is going to change that, is going to make a writer more passionate about what they're writing about, is going to create stories that are more dynamic or enhance character mm -hmm. relationships. That's all coming from a great creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's, a, that's a very good point. It can, it can be somewhat of an echo chamber. If, <laughs> you know. We have very limited time, but I do want to ask you all about pitch season, pilot pitch season. You know, it, 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 we're hearing the last couple of years in particular, you know, there's so much programming on the air, creators are so strained. Do you, there's a lot of, there's a lot more year round efforts, there's a lot more different types of, of development, doing multiple scripts and then straight to series. Um, can you all as writers and producers talk about that? Do you think this is a good thing? Do you think it's going to help the process? Yeah, we're down to like looking for formats from Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that's left. <laughs> but it really is, I mean, it, it, it feels like it's a, it's a very, um, you know, uh, uh, the, it's, it's a very strained time for everybody. Do you, do you all feel that? Is that? Is development even on your horizon right now? It's hard as a showrunner sometimes mm -hmm. with the, I think when we started out, you worked on staff for a while before you developed and now everyone's so hungry that it's very likely that some writer that you love on your staff is gonna say, oh, by the way, I'm doing a pilot. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and sometimes when someone's doing a pilot and being on staff, both things can't yeah. be as perfect as yeah. one would hope. I mean, it, it's weird because it seems like it keeps trying to get out of pilot season, but then pilot season in a weird way keeps rearing its head again. <laughs> the worst thing about pilot season, and the most difficult thing, is I think that in the thick of pilot season, 
your like you will take an actor like you will never have heard them you'll grab they're free fine just hire them you know because you're grabbing everyone fights for the smallest pool of talent and now I think that is happening with writers you know as well but I think it's good news for writers because there's just more outlets than three you know when we started or four mm -hmm. My Greg, you are the Iron Man yeah, of you've pilot awesome. season. <laughs> well, I like that part of the process. It's fun uh, um, working with younger writers, uh, in particular. I think uh, it reminds me sort of they're always enthusiastic and they're nothing but <laughs> hope and optimism about everything that's going to go right. Like your staffs. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, I derive a certain amount of uh, my own enthusiasm from that. So that's that's exciting. I do think it's it's certainly it's later now. It goes later. Everything seems to be happening later, um, and uh, you know, uh, and also conversely, it's it's then all of a sudden when you're green later, the pilot, the series is picked up. You're sort of starting even. Everything's happening so much faster. You get going up, yeah. Uh, and and it is true. It does feel like everyone has a show now. Every actor has a show. <laughs> every writer has a show. Uh, and so um, uh, you're competing with that a little bit, but it's uh, it is exciting. Yeah, it's a great time, folks. We could go for another 45 minutes, but I, we have a pretty hard out. And um, so thank you very much. Thank we you. really appreciate you taking the time. Mm -hmm. And a, a quick schedule change. Uh, we're, uh, the conference is going to take a 15-minute break right now. So thank you all. Thank you.